Thank you. Good morning. I noticed the Baxter table really wasn't clapping, so I appreciate everybody else. But I'm grateful to be with you today. Uh, it is hard to believe that we're already on the last day of Advimed. I'm hopeful and certainly uh, believe that uh, you would join me in, in thanking all those that put everything together. It's been a wonderful uh, conference so far. Uh, as I've walked around, I've seen great conversations, great activity, certainly networking conversations among investors and partners, which quite frankly is exactly what we had envisioned when we were planning the event. Several months ago, our uh, conference chair, Lester Knight, uh, gave me a call and asked me if I would help and chair the host and local committee. Uh, candidly, you can't say no to Lester, and so obviously I, I didn't, and I was grateful for that opportunity. And in all, in all sincerity, it's been a great privilege to work with our local community. Uh, we've tried to tap into Midwest pride, and uh, in particular in Chicago, uh, to ensure that this year's conference was the biggest and the best that Advent has ever seen. I want to offer my sincere appreciation to our committee and all of you who accepted the invitation to be here and trust that you would suggest that we have delivered a high-value conference uh, for you. Of course, our industry is all about value creation. And as you've heard and seen throughout the conference is this year's theme, medical technology, value and innovation for life, underscores how the industry delivers tremendous value to patients, health systems, and to the economy. To that end, there was a recent study from the Milken Institute and it tried to help quantify the value that we are able to create just in a few key medical technologies used to address four serious health conditions, diabetes, heart disease, uh, musculoskeletal disease, and colorectal cancer. They said they, their hypothesis and what they proved is that those four um, diseases and the few technologies that they looked at provided substantial economic benefit to the tune of expanding the U.S. gross domestic product by $106 billion in 2010 and provided the economy a net benefit annually of about $24 billion. And this was just for a handful of technologies for four specific conditions. Certainly the value created by our industry from the countless devices and diagnostics that address the entire spectrum of diseases is significant and is meaningful. And it's a great industry to be in. We have a packed plenary session for you this morning, starting with remarks from uh, House Energy and Commerce Committee Chairman Fred Upton, and ending with an interactive panel and discussion on the rapidly changing U.S. healthcare environment and the challenges and opportunities facing payers and providers. But before we get into the plenary speakers, I want to take a moment and recognize some special guests that are with us today. Back during our conference in 2012, you may remember we launched the MedTech Veterans Program, which trains and mentors veterans and transitioning military for careers in the life science industry. Since its inception, the MVP program has helped connect hundreds of veterans with mentors, held dozens of training sessions across the country, and helped countless veterans find careers in our dynamic and innovative industry. Last month, in fact, Baxter was proud to host this year's sixth MedTech Veterans Recareering event, a day-long workshop where returning veterans learned valuable career-building advice and about the opportunities available in the medical technology industry. Some of the veterans who participated in the program are here with us today. Let's please extend a warm welcome to them and profound thanks for their service. If you'd raise your hand, those, uh, thank you, please stand. Thank you very much. We're very grateful for you being here and more importantly for who you are and what you represent, so thank you. We have another very special group that uh, is joining us this morning. Members of the Scientist Mentoring and Diversity Program, an ethnically diverse group of undergraduate and graduate students they have, been, they have been matched with industry executives to receive training and mentoring to help them transition into careers in medical technology. We're honored to have them with us, and Baxter is proud to partner with a number of other companies, many of you, to provide scholarship and support and mentoring to these students. Please join me in acknowledging them and wishing them well in, in their future career endeavors, and would ask them to stand as well. Thank you and good luck with uh, all your future endeavors. 
Ladies and gentlemen, it's now my pleasure to introduce our plenary speaker this morning from the neighboring state of Michigan, House Energy and Commerce Committee Chairman Fred Upton. Chairman Upton has represented Southwest Michigan since 1987, and among his many policy interests, he has been a strong advocate for patient access to the latest medical innovations and a supporter of the medical technology industry, not only because of our commitment to saving and enhancing lives, but for the high skills, high wage positions we bring to communities across the country. Chairman Upton has been an outspoken advocate for repealing the medical device tax, and as chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee, he led the way in enacting the latest medical device user fee agreement in 2012. The law that enacted this agreement included many important reforms that are helping to improve the, re the review process at FDA. I mentioned that it is our industry's goal to bring value and innovation to patients. Chairman Upton has recently launched a bipartisan uh, initiative, which I anticipate will help our industry fulfill this goal with either great, even greater effectiveness. Under Chairman Upton's leadership, the Energy and Commerce Committee's 21st Century Cures Initiative is taking a comprehensive look at the process for creating cures in the U.S., from discovery to streamlining the device and drug development process to innovative ways to promote patient awareness and access. Central to this initiative is maintaining America's place as a healthcare innovation capital of the world. Chairman Upton, we thank you for your work in this area, for your support, and all that you've done to help us of American medical innovation and improve patient care. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Chairman Fred Upton. Well, good morning. Thanks, everybody, for being here. So uh, we know a lot about the dysfunction that we hear in, in D.C. all the time. And uh, certainly, uh, I want to let you know that a good number of my colleagues uh, are frustrated to the same degree. So I chair the Energy and Commerce Committee. And I'd like to say, well, we are the oldest committee in the House, uh, arguably the one with the most jurisdiction, right, Charlie Dent? My colleague uh, from Pennsylvania, Charlie Dent's here from the Appropriations Committee. But in essence, uh, what we say is we have jurisdiction over the world. <laughs> we have energy, we have environment, we have telecommunications. If you've got an iPhone, it only works because of what we did on this spectrum 10 years ago, commerce, manufacturing, trade, as well as uh, oversight and investigations and health. So my MO as chairman has always been to be bipartisan. And in fact, in my uh, first term as chairman of the Energy and Commerce uh, Committee, we passed 88 bills on the House floor, of which 40 became law, and virtually every one had bipartisan support. In this Congress, we're on the same track. We've passed 75 bills on the House floor that have gotten through our committee. 25 of them are law, signed by the President. And the 50 that have not become law, every one has had Democrat support. I'm a Republican, Democrat support. And Almost two-thirds of those, in fact, passed with better than a two-thirds vote. So that's not bad. That's not a bad record of trying to get things done. And on the health side, we've got a great record to, to crow about. Fidesia, PDUFA, Drug Quality and Security, Children's Hospital, GME, EpiPens, Pediatric Research, Track and Trace, all of those things, major pieces of legislation that are now law. But my interest in disease research and the power of devices and pharmaceuticals to improve patients' lives goes back to a long time before I became chairman. My district in southwest Michigan includes uh, Kalamazoo. Kalamazoo was the founding facility for Upjohn, now Pfizer. Obviously, Stryker started there as well, and I've truly enjoyed my relationship with John and Rosemary Brown as well as the current CEO of Stryker, Kevin Lobo, who's here this morning. Back in the 90s, it was my bill that I partnered with Henry Waxman and John McCain and Paul Wellstone to double the money for the NIH, which became law. And we know that the U.S. has been a global leader in innovations, 
and we want to stay that way. And that's why it is so important that we move forward on a new initiative that we launched almost a year ago called 21st Century Cures. Yes, it is bipartisan. And I commend my, my uh, partner, my Democratic uh, colleague who has co-authored uh, this effort with me, Diana DeGette uh, from Colorado. Right now we're on a listening tour. In fact, we had a great one yesterday in Kalamazoo. Uh, but literally we've had almost two dozen subcommittee hearings and, and round tables, uh, not only in Washington, but around the country uh, as well. And what we're doing right now is listening. We're listening to every stakeholder that's out there. We wanna do this thing right. And our focus is really threefold uh, in terms of the cycle that we're trying to figure out. We wanna help with the discovery and then the development and then the delivery of drugs and devices because we know that that's gonna only save lives and patients will have better access to technology. So these two dozen round tables and, and bills, uh, uh, subcommittee hearings that we've had, your organization has been involved, I wanna say, in every single one of them. We've had great witnesses. Uh, yesterday in Kalamazoo, we had Dr. Francis Collins, we had Je Jeff Shuren from the FDA who's here today, Kevin Lobo. Uh, the last hearing that we had in Washington just a couple weeks ago, uh, we had Sylvia Burwell. Uh, of course, she is the Secretary of HHS. We've had a good number of discussions with her, and I wanna tell you the administration is solidly on board. Uh, they wanna see this thing happen as well. And at yesterday's hearing, Dr. Collins said, you know, if you think research is expensive, you wait to see what the disease cost is gonna be. That's gotta be our mission. We need to reduce the costs as well and be able to get these drugs and devices into the marketplace. Now, what's our timetable? Well, we're hoping to finish our listening tour before the end of the year. And early next year in January, we're gonna release our discussion draft, our pre-draft of a bill. And as chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee, we're gonna mark this bill up before Easter. So we're gonna have some more hearings, gonna actually get it approved uh, through our committee. Uh, we expect to have our legislation on the House floor before Memorial Day. We're working now to identify a Republican and Democratic U.S. Senator who will partner with us, who will introduce similar, if not identical, legislation because for a bill to become a law, back to ninth grade civics, House, Senate, work it out, get it to the President. We want to get it to the President before the end of next year to see that it is enacted. So your ideas, specifics, are most welcome. Now we have a website cures at mail.house.gov, cures at mail, as in mailman, mailwoman, cures at mail.house.gov. We wanna make CMS, we wanna make that process more efficient. We wanna work on IRBs, we wanna utilize uh, digital medicine uh, to use the technology we have today. We've got a lot of good ideas. Uh, the bottom line is health innovation is moving, we know, at lightning speed. Somehow we have to keep the governmental policies to keep pace with that innovation and to provide the assistance that's needed to get these drugs and devices into the, into the uh, patient sector where we also obviously create jobs. Uh, this is a win-win. So if we can close the gap between the science of cures and the regulatory environment, I know that we'll have done our job. So it's bipartisan. Every stakeholder has uh, been asked to participate. And your organization has been most useful in getting us to where we wanna be, where we're beginning to, to uh, as we begin to round the bases uh, to get this thing done and enacted into law. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here last night and today, and before I head back to Michigan, uh, have, have a great day. Thanks so very much. God bless.
Thank you, Chairman Upton. We, we are very grateful for all of your work, and we're, we appreciate you being here. Before we move to the next portion of our program this morning, I want to acknowledge one additional member of the audience. Uh, we're very pleased, uh, and, and Chairman Upton uh, mentioned this, but we're very pleased that Pennsylvania Congressman Charlie Dent is also here with us today. Congressman Dent has represented his eastern Pennsylvania district since 2005 and has been a strong advocate of medical innovation and passionate, and passionate proponent for the repeal of the medical device excise tax. Congressman Dent, we thank you for your support. We also want to welcome you to the conference. would ask that we give both of these gentlemen a round of applause. Thank you. It is important uh, that, to us that you're here, both of you. Thank you. Now for the next portion of our program, uh, we really have an, another great opportunity. Everyone here is acutely aware of the enormous changes that are impacting the U.S. health care system and its landscape. The Affordable Care Act, the growing cost containment pressures, consolidation and other market forces have and will continue to have far-reaching impacts. Uh, and perhaps unforeseen consequences for patients and for the medical technology industry, and frankly, for all segments of the healthcare industry for years to come. To discuss these changes from a payer and a provider perspective, we have assembled a terrific panel of health policy experts, including Susan DeVore, President and CEO of Premier, Dr. Scott Josephs, Vice President and National Medical Officer of Cigna, and Mark Neiman, President and CEO of North Shore University Health System. These organizations, as you know, are pioneers in the healthcare delivery and are key partners in helping our industry enhance patient care and efficiently introduce innovation into the healthcare system. To lead today's panel discussion, I want to welcome back Senior Policy Advisor for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Susan Denser, who did a terrific job of moderating yesterday's plenary session with FDA Commissioner Hamburg. Please join me in welcoming back Susan Denser and the panel. Thank you very much, Brick, for that lovely introduction, and good morning to all of you, and welcome to our panel on the role of payers and providers in influencing the course of medical technology. Uh, Chairman Upton said, Health innovation is moving at lightning speed. We know that what's happening in the healthcare delivery system and in the insurance system is moving, if at anything, at even faster speed at this point. So we, as he mentioned, as Brick mentioned, we have three terrific individuals to talk about this subject today and the influence on medical technology. He mentioned them by name and title. Let me tell you just a bit more about them so you have uh, some more background. Susan DeVore, as he said, is president and CEO of Premier. Premier is a leading health improvement company, health care improvement company, an alliance now of more than 300,000, no, three, excuse me, three, <laughs> sorry, 3,000 US hospitals. Nice. God help us if there were 300,000 US hospitals. <laughs> sorry, 3,000 US hospitals, nearly 110,000, that's the uh, larger number, providers engaged in transforming health care. Susan has uh, three decades of experience in this sector. She's an industry leading thinker who, among other things, has been named to modern healthcare's 100 most influential people in healthcare. So, Susan, terrific to have you with us. Also with us is Scott Josephs. He's National Medical Officer at Cigna Healthcare, where he oversees clinical programs, coverage, reimbursement policy, and quality. In other words, pretty much everything that goes on at Cigna. He's a 14-year veteran of the company. He earned his medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania, and he's a board-certified internal uh, medicine physician. And we're also very happy to have with us Mark Neiman, who's president and chief executive officer of North Shore University Health System. He's had that position since 1992, has spent his entire career in Evanston, just up the road, uh, joining that hospital after earning his Master of Science degree from Ohio State University. He also has a very distinguished background, among other things. He's been the recipient of the highest award given out by the ACHE, the American College of Healthcare Executives, the Gold Medal Award. So again, welcome to all of you. Well, as we said, this is a time of just enormous change. 
Mark's system, for example, just announced it's going to be merging with Advocate, another very large hospital system here in Illinois. Susan's company just went public a year ago. Cigna is now uh, on a bunch of health insurance exchanges uh, that may not have been on a year ago. Lots of tumult happening. Let's start by talking about where you think all of this is going. What's ahead for your sectors in the year ahead? Susan? So Premier is a performance improvement company and we deal with hospitals, health systems, and all these uh, integrated delivery providers um, across the country. And what I would say is their biggest challenge is that they all know fee-for-service is dead. It, it's dead. 70% uh, of patients now are in some form of payment and even if it's fee-for-service it has modifiers around quality, around safety, around readmissions. So their biggest challenge is to figure out how do they take care of the cost of health care? How do they treat patients consistently across payers and with all kinds of disparate technology and disparate business intelligence capabilities? And so we're trying to take what has been a cottage and fragmented industry and put it together in an integrated way. Um, and there's not enough capital and there's not enough operating uh, revenues uh, to do all the things they want to do so they're having to prioritize what they do and the consumer is becoming more and more actively involved in the decisions that are being made so it's a bit chaotic um, we see I travel all over the country every day and we see all kinds of different models all kinds of different measurement there is no standardization of the measurement um, and so a really challenging time for providers <clears throat> Oh, sounds easy. Yeah. Okay, Scott, what about in the insurance sector? What, what's changing? Where are we going to be a year from now? What are the strategic imperatives for your industry? So uh, last night I was at dinner, and I learned that the enemy used to be the FDA, but apparently it's now us. <laughs> um, and actually, we're, we're <laughs> um, and we're not the enemy. What we're trying to do is deal with a very, as Susan said, a frenetic environment. The population's getting older. There's 10,000 baby boomers turning 65 every single day. That's going to happen for the next 20 years. Healthcare costs continue to rise. At Cigna, we're actually 85% administrative services only, ASO, which means that we're stewards of our employers' money. And they can't, keep, they can't afford the constant rise in costs. They're asking for help. And we're here to try to help them. And the way you do that is you ground you're grounded around three core principles. The first is improving quality of care. That's what you're all about, right? New technology actually helps improve the human experience, right? It helps people live ha healthier and full lives. We're actually very supportive of that, of course. Secondly, we have to make healthcare affordable and frankly, sustainable. I want my children, my grandchildren, to have the same high quality healthcare that exists today. And the third is around consumer experience. Consumers are being asked to sh share much more of the burden of the cost, and so we want to improve their experience as they do that. They're de demanding more. So our strategy really is very simple. It's about engaging consumers, giving them the information they need to make the right choices, the coaching, the guidance, working with their smartphones. It's about developing tighter relationships with physicians and hospitals that share our values, that want to help sustain the delivery system. And finally, it's about connecting the two. So historically, we were viewed as getting in between the doctor and the patient. Instead, what we want to do is add value to that equation and engender these tighter relationships. Mark, your perspective. I may just add a few comments to what Susan and Scott have already mentioned. From the healthcare provider perspective, it's all about changing the practice of medicine in America. The old ways of doing things are not going to suffice any further, any longer. It's really a lot about alignment to make sure that our organizations are tightly, tightly integrated delivery systems of primary care physicians, specialty physicians, hospitals, and the like. And once you have the alignment, it's a lot about what you see in your industry, and that's all about having the right data and using powerful, transformational data analytics to either prove efficacy in what we're doing or take out variability, which is both bad quality, bad outcomes, and more expensive, and make sure that we improve the way that we're doing it, because the stakes are very high for us as providers. 
Uh, we're going to have to take these new payment methodologies that are no longer, as Susan mentioned, fee for service, but some sort of financial risk in addition to the clinical risk, and make all of this work. And it sounds like a big challenge, and it is, uh, but uh, many of us are quite optimistic about the opportunity to really make that difference in transforming the practice of medicine in America. So as we mentioned, Mark, your system is now combining with Advocate. We've got a lot of uh, this consolidation going on across the marketplace. How far does it go? Are we going to see an environment where we get shrinkage of numbers of systems, perhaps even facilities? We know that inpatient <clears throat> care is declining. Uh, so are we going to see shrinkage of systems, more consolidation, and not just on the provider side, on the insurance side as well? Are we going to see fewer players out there running this entire sector on both sides? Susan. Yeah, so I'll start and I'll say that I think the, the challenge for uh, device companies and the challenge in the industry is that we will see both horizontal consolidation and vertical consolidation at the same time. So I think with the advent of ACOs and health systems needing to connect physicians and hospitals and nursing homes and surgery centers and people at home, um, I think there will be horizontal consolidation and integration. I also think a lot of health systems, once they get the size horizontally and the scale, they begin to vertically integrate. So if you think about supply chain, which is where, where you interact with health systems, um, they're vertically integrating their supply chains. They're consolidating their decision making. They're adding components. They're bringing distribution and specialty pharmacy and PBMs and medical devices and capital equipment together um, and looking at its effectiveness as a continuum. So I think the challenge for you is going to be you're going to be dealing with both things at the same time. Scott? So what we're doing is we're creating relationships with physicians and hospitals that share our values. So we have over 100, we call them collaborative accountable care organizations, or ACOs, with over a million lives around the country. And it's predicated on three things. It's predicated on, one, aligning incentives to making sure that the doctors are motivated to improve quality and help reduce unnecessary medical costs. Secondly, it's predicated upon providing information we give them act actionable information at the point of contact so that they're able to take better care of their patients. And finally, it's around clinical collaboration. But we're going to be choosing our partners so the network of doctors that you see, these wide, open, expansive networks, will be shrinking. And there'll be, we call them tailored networks. You might have heard the term narrow networks. There'll be smaller subsets of networks where there's partnership. So you're going to see that in the in insurance industry. And of course, you see that with um, uh, uh, provider consolidation. And, and just a comment about provider consolidation. Um, there's a misconception that we oppose that, and, and that's just not true. Uh, where provider consolidation adds improved quality and efficiency into the system, it's a good thing. It will improve outcomes. It will take costs out of the system. It's only where it's simply uh, leading to increased costs and not improving those other uh, attributes where we would have concern. Mark. From the provider perspective, particularly as we look at metropolitan areas like Chicago, the consolidation is inevitable. There's an excess capacity, particularly on the hospital side of this. We're seeing more and more of the care moved outside of the hospital for a system like North Shores. Only 30% of our revenues are the inpatient hospital businesses anymore. And so with these factors coming along, we've got to develop scale. We have to have scale in order to take out cost in the system, and frankly, we need that scale in order to have enough, finan enough financial power to be able to reinvest in transforming the practice of medicine. This is where we really need your help in coming up with the next whole generation of drugs and devices and so on that we can help transform that practice of medicine. We know on our side, we've got to have the finances and the systems to make all of that work, and hence scale becomes critically important to us. So what you all are doing is painting a picture of more integrated networks, more horizontal networks, fewer of them, bigger systems, more concentrated and focused decision making, decision making heavily driven by analytics, data and analytics about what, does, what accomplishes the most value for the patient at the most affordable, sustainable cost. That's an equation that this industry obviously worries a lot about. 
Um, it, to the degree that they can make the case that their technology is value added, they will flourish. To the degree that they can't, they will not. And apropos of that, AvaMed released a study on Monday, in-depth interviews with nine major insurers covering 110 million Americans showing that they are tightening up on the evidence that they require for coverage of new technologies, and that six in 10 out of those interviewed uh, are, being, are caring for people, as you said earlier, under new pay, uh, provider payment models, such as pay for performance and so on. The most troubling finding that they surfaced was that four in 10 of those respondents said it will be more difficult for clinically appropriate but costly technologies to gain coverage. Clinically appropriate but expensive. And that's where the greatest concern arises. Susan, is that scenario going to materialize? I think the focus on value is, is absolutely going to be a given. Um, and so I think the, the challenge is, how do we get to transformational innovation as opposed to incremental innovation? Incremental innovation is a lot harder to prove a business case for, a clinical case for. A transformational, and, and so I don't know which one you're talking about. If it's transformational innovation, it gets people out of acute care settings, it keeps them at home, it's connected to other devices, it's connected to other business intelligence. That business case, I think, is a lot easier. Um, there's, there's a real challenge in the industry because we don't have unique device identification, because we don't have data across the continuum, uh, because there is a lot of incremental innovation, um, and I think that challenge will continue, and I think that reality um, will be very difficult for medical device uh, manufacturers. And so I would encourage you to think about how do you make your products more generic? I know this is going to be a, a, not a popular comment. How do you defeat your products as opposed to incrementally add to products? That, that sounds like it would do the opposite. Well, it more generic. What, what do you uh, mean? To me, the question is, if you take a group of products and there's a tremendous variation in price and the price is going up, I mean, this is one of the few industries where innovation ca causes the price to go up always. We've got to get to a total cost of care equation that causes the total cost to go down. And, and if there is a generic or a defeatured uh, version, or if there is a different intervention that actually is proven to lead to better or equal clinical outcomes, the reality is the, the financial pressure is going to be such that those are going to be um, um, explored for sure. So if I'm, a, if I'm a, a device manufacturer, I'm thinking, how do I prove that my product is cost effective, that it's safe and lowers harm, lowers mortality, lowers readmissions, can be used or connected to devices in the continuum, um, and can be proven across a broad set of providers that it actually changes the clinical outcome. And I think that's the challenge. Scott, how do you see this? Well, first, I'd like you to put down your tomatoes. I wasn't one of those four that said I want to squelch innovation, so I want to make that clear. I didn't say I want to squelch innovation. I want transformational innovation that really changes the clinical outcome. That's an absolutely, and absolutely agree with that. So I lead a coverage and reimbursement policies. Uh, so how do we look at techno new technology? If it's obviously clinically inferior, nobody wants it. If it's clinically appropriate but equal, equally efficacious, equal outcomes to existing technologies, then, frankly, it's just adding cost to the system if it's more expensive. And that's not something we will prefer. If it's clearly superior in providing value, as Houston said, and let's talk about value in a minute, if it's clearly superior and adds cost, well, then you've got to talk about what is the uh, compensating value for this. And, and let's step back a second. Let's just look at the entire system. So Institute of Medicine in 2012 said we're spending $2.7 trillion in healthcare, about 18% of our GDP, and $765 billion is waste, waste and abuse, all right? Some of that we want to take out of that system, and some of that, frankly, we want to in invest and innovate. So we don't want to squelch innovation, but it has to add value. What is value? Think about the numerator and value. It's outcomes. It's quality. It's less disability, it's less presenteeism, it's less absenteeism. We want to improve the, the value, the quality. The denominator is cost. 
as I said, our employers are saying, look, the, n most of our employers don't say, we just want the cheapest out there. We want what's most valuable. But tell me for my expensive dollar that I spend, healthcare costs are, are onerous to employers who are trying to run their business in a tough economy. Tell me what I'm getting for my healthcare costs. Show me that these new technologies are superior. We have to change the, com uh, are superior in, in adding value. So we have to change the conversation. It's not just about the lowest unit cost. Mark. Let me add maybe just a little bit different perspective than uh, what my colleagues have put forth so far. First of all, the pressure for cost on the providers is enormous. We've got to take into the equation each and every day and what we look at. But some of these improvements that are available through the technologies that you produce uh, may seem small, but they're very important to us. Uh, we did a study a few, uh, few months ago with a small device that uh, eliminated some affections uh, in the overall IV lines. It was really pennies on the dollar. But using our database, we were able to prove that it was not only efficacious, but less expensive. Now, what we have then is a kind of equation that really says, even though it's relatively small in things, it can actually work. And we can prove with you that it's efficacious and reduces our cost. Think about it for us providers on the things that are, are bigger. We just did a, a study where we implemented uh, some of the new uh, heart valves that are coming out. Uh, one of our responsibilities is to do that well. One of our responsibilities is to work with you quickly. Uh, six weeks from the time FDA approval till we had uh, three patients up and running on the new trials. Uh, that's part of what we've got to do to not only prove efficacy, but work and bring things out more, more quickly with you. For leading healthcare providers, don't forget that even the biggest, sexiest, newest technologies become important if you want to attract the best talent related to physicians and caregivers, and reputationally have that reputation to keep being in the forefront of leading medicine and uh, to be able to attract the future talent and the future patients and customers to your system. So it might be a, a little bit more of a micro view of things uh, in terms of what's going on out there. Uh, we need the technologies. We just need to prove, demonstrate, that they're actually valuable, both improving quality and taking out costs. So you're injecting a note of optimism here. There is a future for technologies, even if costly ones, that really do demonstrate the value yeah. that give you a competitive edge in the marketplace. Absolutely. Absolutely. Keep it coming. We, <laughs> we, I mean, okay. we, have to, we have to work differently, I think, is the message, Susan, but we still need those breakthrough technologies. Okay. Well, let's talk for a moment, if we'll, we'll get a little bit down in the weeds, on payment methodologies here, because as all of you have said, we're moving to a new, different world of payment methodologies away from fee-for-service, some of which is leading us to ACO-type arrangements, others to bundle, for example. And one CEO apparently uh, said, uh, in this industry, said he was told by surgeons that they'd like to adopt his clinically superior technology into a bundling demo, but it would raise the cost, and therefore they weren't going to use it. The cost was just not in the benchmark. So. Some in the industry say, well, let's have a special adjustment on, for bundles where we could just have the expensive technology on top of that. Is that realistic, Scott, from your perspective, or yeah, are that, bundles that going me. to be what they are? That wasn't me. <laughs> okay. I want to change my seat. Um, <laughs> uh, so let's talk about what bundles are, right? But, you know, we, we met, bundles are an episode of care payment. It could be prospective or retrospective around a certain uh, disease or treatment. Uh, episode, we look at four metrics. Does it reduce the cost per episode? Does it improve quality? Does it reduce, reduce preventable, avoidable complications? Does it reduce things like C section, unnecessary C sections, readmissions, uh, and does it improve the patient experience? That's what we look for. It's 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 all of those things, right? If we're losing out on quality outcomes, so if we're not allowing the surgeons to use the the best, the best technology, which is going to lead to a better outcome. We lose. We may win in the short run, we lose in the long run. We want to have customer stickiness. We want our customers to stay with us for a lifetime, from cradle to grave. We don't want them to leave because Cigna is the cheap company. That's not what it's about, right? But as Susan earlier said, it's about data. Show us that this is improving value. Show us. So I understand your point that you want to have the best surgeons uh, at your institute, but show us that the patient outcomes will be better because you have the best surgeons using the best technology. Then we'll have a conversation. Right. So bundles shouldn't scare you. Right? 
if you're able to show that your technology was going to add value, improve the outcomes, and overall help healthcare be higher quality and more sustainable, we're going to have that conversation. And again, I'd like you to join in the conversation with us. If the bundles, if in fact technology is so good and you have to raise the cost of the bundle, we'll have that conversation. But again, it's not just about paying for incremental changes that just lead to increased costs. And do you think, broadly speaking, more payers are like you, willing to have those conversations about opening up bundles, adjusting things over time uh, as new technology arises? Well, I want arises? to be clear, clear. We, we are the best payer. Okay? I, <laughs> okay. I just w w want, to, want to be clear about that. Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't want to speak for I don't want to speak for every payer, but I think it's a it's a short-sighted business proposition to go for the cheapest cost only. We don't want the cheapest doctors. We're not making we're not creating ACOs with low-quality, low-cost doctors. We want high-quality, preferably low-cost doctors. And frankly, something we have high-quality, higher-cost doctors. But if the outcome is going to be good overall, that's who we want. So again, it's not about the lowest price point. Price is just a factor in the value equation. So it, this is, as we have said over and over again, this is going to require all of these folks to establish more, have more data, bring to, come to the table to, to speak with you with more data, which means more trials, <clears throat> longer cost. This is an industry that also has, is fighting uh, for capital support and, uh, and other things that it needs to survive. How is this going to work? Can you conceive of, of sort of partnership type arrangements that mm -hmm. over time can accumulate the kinds of data that you need, or is it all gonna be on them, Susan? So I think it does, it does change the game a lot. Actually, across town we have uh, going on today what's called a Healthcare Innovators Collaborative. And it's all about how do we take what has been a health care information technology disabled world and make it HIT enabled and connect all of the data. And I would say it doesn't have to, Susan, be clinical trials, the length of clinical trials, and manufacturer-sponsored research. Um, in a way, I think that we're, we're working a lot more in what I would call practical application of comparative effectiveness with uh, manufacturers. And the idea is, if HIT really does get enabled, and you have hospital data, and you have payer data, and you have physician data, and you have ambulatory data, and you have all kinds of data that you can connect technologically, and if you have a footprint like we have, and data on thousands of, of healthcare uh, systems across the country, you can begin to see and isolate uh, potentially the impact of medical devices on harm, on readmissions, on patient satisfaction, on mortality, on cost, and look at all of that together. And we very much want to do that with manufacturers and with our data. And then we want manufacturers to go with us to the next step, and, and maybe Scott would like this too, which is to go at risk with the price of the product for the difference in clinical outcome. And I've been saying that for about 10 years now, and I don't have a risk agreement yet. I mean, I'm really interested in manufacturers who are willing to sort of have it tested in a practical, uh, real-time environment, as opposed to, we just don't have time for, and, and the money for um, the more traditional forms of research. And I mean, they're important. <laughs> I, I don't want to be quoted as saying, I don't think that that's important. but I. But I think once you've got that basic research, we've then got to go to the practical application of it. And these kinds of arrangements, as we know, are increasingly common, particularly in Europe, and right. particularly with respect to pharmaceuticals, right. that manufacturers now are being asked by health systems overseas to go at risk on right. prices and are agreeing to those right. arrangements as a condition of getting new products on the marketplace. Right. It does seem as if that all moved faster in the pharmaceutical sector than the device sector. Why? Do you have any insight? Sure, I actually do have insight, but at first I want to uh, kind of be very clear here. I know that we want to move devices quicker through the continuum, but we will never compromise on patient safety. We can't. That's our obligation. And I know that's the point of contention, but I, I just need to affirm that here. Regarding uh, uh, 
pharmaceutical manufacturers. We have two unique relationships I want to talk about because I think it's illustrative of what can occur with, with, uh, with your industry. With EMD Serono, with a drug called Rebif, which is for multiple sclerosis, we have an outcomes-based contract. And by paying them more for better outcomes, uh, what we've been able to find is 43% of fewer hospitalizations and 98% better adherence to drug regimens. It's a win, 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 win. Everybody wins. The manufacturer wins, we win, the patient wins, the healthcare professional wins, right? It's one example. Second example, with Merck, a drug called Genuvia for diabetes. Again, outcome-based contract. By uh, engaging this contract where there's a discount but there'll be an improvement in volume and overall and, and price if you reach certain uh, highlights. And in fact, we're actually partnering, we're providing tools to help the patients take better care of their diabetes. We've been able to find a 5% drop in hemoglobin A1C, which is uh, the measure of diabetes. And adherence, and this is a control study, went from 65% to 87%, right? So innovative contracting can occur and the whole point is changing the conversation, as, as Mark said earlier. We have to speak differently than we did. It can't be about, we have to push this drug from a resource development through the system. We've got to recoup our investment. We've got to make sure the payers cover it. We've got to fight, 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 as opposed to doing things innovative, as you alluded to. And I didn't realize you were on this for 10 years. I mean, you're way ahead of your time. I thought about this last night. So. Um, um, there are ways to talk about it differently if, uh, than we've done historically. I'll just add, I think one of the things that has uh, slowed this process down has been the, on the provider side, the, uh, the slowness in which we've adopted electronic medical records uh, technology, sort of the basics of what you need to have to build the database. Uh, fortunate North Shore, we've been at it for a dozen years, and so we've had uh, a lot uh, better than some of our colleagues' uh, opportunities to use data analytics. And when you get to the really understanding if these things work or not, um, claims data is a starting point but an insufficient finish line. You really need the clinical data. What, hap <clears throat> excuse me, what happened, what were the outcomes? Trace patients longitudinally, trace patients over time to see if it really makes a sustainable difference in things like diabetes. And so uh, I think part of the blame really goes on providers to really have to step up the pace, really uh, implement not only the electronic medical record systems, but the underlying data analytics. So Susan, nobody's mentioned though um, what I think is the biggest challenge and the biggest difference, and that is there is a standard numbering description system in pharmaceuticals across the industry, across all suppliers. It doesn't exist in medical device. Mm -hmm. And so the ability to actually know which supplier, which product, and which one is exactly equal to another one um, is not enabled. Um, and I think this unique device uh, identifier is the attempt to do that. It's got a long runway to, to being implemented. Um, we actually have to spend a lot of time and effort uh, comparing pricing amongst suppliers for what are the same products. And, and for us, the challenge is that the variation in pricing for the exact same supplier and exact same product is still 40 to 60 percent. So if I look at CRM, if I look at spine, if I look at joint, um, and I look across our 3,000 hospitals, that variation is still 45 to 60 percent in price, same product, and the variation has gone up, not down. And that, so, so my, sometimes I say to my kids, you know, you know I wish um, you would tell me what you know that you think I don't know. <laughs> I say that to my employees too. And when I say that, I often get interesting things. And one of the things I would tell you that I wish you knew is there's a 46, 40 to 60% variation in the price of your products. And you probably already know this better than I do. And it's probably more than that. I don't know. Uh, but, but providers are beginning to figure that out and to say, I don't understand that, and, and how, do we, how do we change that? And uh, because you run, for example, the largest ACO collaborative, you're in a position to surface that information. What are you in a position to do about it? You know, the, the, the decision-making is being made in different ways now, the collaboration across the continuum. 
the how do we really differentiate um, the price of a product. I mean, the, the ultimate bundle is, is a global capitation. And I think a bundled payment program is a natural evolution to a global payment program where everything's in. Um, I also think for device manufacturers, this, this potential issue of class of trade um, today, there are, for, for all manufacturers, there are different price points for different uh, locations of the service. The ACO um, world means that all products uh, will be priced across all settings in same ways. So there will be, I think, differences in variation that gets rooted out, differences in classes of cra trade and how things are priced in different settings when ACOs are are fully up and running. Uh, but as you know, they're struggling. They, they have to have the infrastructure. They have to have the relationships and the clinical integration. And so this is going to be messy for all of us uh, for a while, I think. And if you think about capitation, uh, so you can talk about capitation in a very large multi-specialty group or PHL, and you can talk about that. When you're talking about small groups, a five provider, five provider group, whether it's specialty or primary care, uh, capitation uh, incurs insurance risk. You get the transplant, you get the cardiomyopathy, and that's not going to hunt. So we have to have innovative payment ways, like bundles, that say, look, for like cases, you ought to be, it ought to be costing this. Understanding how new technology fits to that and the, and the value equation, we need to have those discussions. Also, what does value mean over time? You know, what, what, what time span? But nonetheless, we have to understand the delivery system, although there is consolidation, there still are those groups that are small, and we have to have a payment scheme that will enable them to take better care of their patient and help healthcare be more sustainable. Mark, did you want to add anything to that, Mark? Okay. So, one of the issues that this industry is tremendously worried about, and we had a lot of conversation on our panel yesterday, mainly the industry is to some degree leaving the United States. It's going to Europe, mm. it's relocating to Europe. It finds uh, the ability to attract capital apparently better there, the ability to get products on the market faster there. To what degree do, do your sectors have any kind of a role in encouraging some of this industry to remain alive, thriving here in the United States? To what degree do we all have a stake in having a, a really healthy medical device industry here in the U.S., and what would you all be prepared to do about it? Mark, you said earlier that you need these people. You need these people for competitive reasons, if nothing else. Uh, what is the future of a kind of a partnership that, that actually ensures the survival of this industry? It'll be a little tough for us to relocate to Europe, so uh, we kind of <laughs> like to have all the support we can get uh, here, here in the U.S. I think from a provider side, a couple things we can do to be helpful. One, build the underlying systems, the data analytics systems to help prove efficacy. I think that's part of our responsibility. Two, get alignment of our clinicians to make sure that we're not just doing everything in a separate way, in a different way, not doing it in a one-off. But I think there's a third thing related to scale. And as we build these uh, uh, larger, more complex, but more capable systems, keep in mind that we as providers also have scale. And are those the opportunities that we could jointly help fund or help develop or help jointly de define and uh, invest in these new technologies as both providers as well as uh, the, the folks here at Avamed? What, what would you say to that, Scott? Yeah, so first, uh, Cigna is actually in 30 countries around the world. So um, uh, healthcare isn't just in the United States and there are needs out there as well, which many of you help supply. Um, uh, but we want to obviously continue the innovation here. I think we need different conversation than we've had uh, to help promote that. It, it's certainly not our job to uh, come up with new technologies, but maybe to, to encourage a milieu where innovation will occur. And, and to do that, we're going to need different payment schemes, different conversations around how to make that happen. But we want something back, which is better outcomes, uh, overall, overall reduced, uh, reduced cost uh, and improved satisfaction, frankly, the, the triple aim. We need, we need to have this give and take conversation, but we can't do it on kind of a push-pull on every single device. And remember, there are going to be winners and losers in this. 
right? So those who create Me Too drugs or Me Too uh, devices with incremental uh, improvement, uh, it's not going to hunt. But if we have something that's going to add value in the way we defined it earlier, then let's have a, a, a different conversation. I'd like to partner with you to help make uh, to help uh, continue America's leadership in the uh, uh, technology industry. Susan, anything to add to that? You know, um, I worry the most about tax inversions and and the reasons companies move uh, be, uh, because of the tax inversion issue. Um, interestingly, commodity manufacturers have moved a long time ago uh, to other more uh, efficient places to to manufacture and. We decided to buy a, a direct sourcing company because we wanted to test the, the concept of if you move it overseas, what happens to the cost of the product. And if clinical providers define the specifications for product, can we have them contract manufactured in an efficient way and get uh, better clinical specifications to the product? As well as presumably lower cost. As presumably lower cost, yeah. and we wanted to test that theory. Um, and we did test that theory, uh, and we did find that we could get higher clinical specifications at 15 to 20 percent lower cost. And so as long as that's true, it's going to be really hard. And the second reason we did buy the direct sourcing company, though, was to figure out how we could define the specs, get it contract manufactured, and then figure out how we bring it back to the U.S. and use some of the excess manufacturing capacity here. It's a lot easier, granted, for commodities. But I just like the thought process, which is if clinical providers like North Shore help define the clinical specifications they want in products, mm -hmm. and then those get manufactured by manufacturers, um, I think that is a, a more efficient and probably more clinically effective outcome. It sounds like another opportunity yeah. for conversations and yeah. partnerships. Yeah, it with is the industry. an opportunity yeah. for collaboration. For um, you know, we've got now the the Payment Sunshine Act, mm -hmm. and so that's shedding this this light, good, bad, or otherwise, on um, the existing traditional relationships. And I think together as an industry, we need to figure out how to, how to do this differently and more, more efficiently. All right, so let's just quickly recap what you all have said. First of all, it's a chaotic time. You use the words chaos and frenzy. The consolidation, the mergers, the transformation, the vertical integration, the horizontal integration. It's all leading to a new world, a new world of payment, a new a, abandoning fee for service, moving to these new payment arrangements, and therefore precipitating the need for new conversations around, as you said, Susan, transformational technologies, not just incremental ones. Mm -hmm. uh, conversations that expose the price variation and potentially weed that out of the marketplace. Conversations built around data and efficacy. Show me the value. Demonstrate to me the outcomes are improved. But it's also an opportunity for new partnerships, new conversations, as we've just been saying, actually collaboration around data, efficacy, outcomes, et cetera. Uh, and as you said, Mark, you need this technology for competitive reasons, and you have scale. You have the, the ability to actually to create the environment in which all of this could be rolled out. So we have uh, less than a minute remaining in Twitter length phrases, uh, if you would, 140 characters or so. Tell us what you think is the most important thing in to launch these conversations going forward with this industry over the next year or so. Susan, quickly. Bring your evidence and data. Bring a willingness to collaborate and take risk. Focus on transformational innovation, not incremental innovation. And figure out and tell me how your product's going to affect quality, safety, readmissions, patient experience, mortality, and cost. Scott. Like she said, uh, <laughs> period, perfect. Mark. Uh, you clearly need the data. In all of this, don't forget about the people we ultimately serve, the consumers and the patients and families that we serve, because there's a whole new realm of technology that we've also need to transfer to the patients and the end users themselves. Great. Well, join me in thanking this panel for a terrific conversation about all of this. Thank you. Thank you.